Hello, this is Caroline Monroe. And I'm Martine Beswick. And we're here to tell you about this wonderful and exciting new project that we've both been involved with. It's called Sinbad and the Pirate Princess. And it's a movie for your ear. Baghdad. The great city and its citizens are celebrating. Now, as I am a river to my people. You must kill her, my handsome and still skeptical Captain Sinbad. The only good pirate is a dead one. Brace yourself, Captain Bula! The pirates are upon us! Their ship comes alongside us! I shall not rest until all of Badra's ships are burnt. You remind me of only one other swordsman with such skill. Who? Me! <sighs> what is that in that vial? This? Simply the blood of a siren mixed into a potion that I now drink. Look! Look! She changes, Captain! For you and the people of Zalos, I have complete faith in Sinbad. He's the very man you need. You're listening to Poe Forevermore Radio Theater. This court sentences you to be hung by the neck until dead for the crime of murder. Poe Forevermore Radio Theater, bringing you the best original audio dramas of mystery and imagination, electrifying original tales, and adaptations of classic favorites. And now, the star and producer of Poe Forevermore Radio Theater, Mark Redfield. For our telling of Poe's famous story, The Black Cat, we take that resilient feline by the tail and swing it yowling into swinging 60s London, into psychedelic Carnaby Street, by way of a chance encounter in Rome. Amid the artists and models of new sights and sounds, a generation consumed by a new openness and curiosity, a new freedom. But, this being Poe in its telltale heart, we mix it up with one madman. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a story. In telling our version, I'm very happy to share the microphone with my co-star, Caroline Monroe. She plays Rita, the open, curious, and innocent part of the story. I play Alf, the unreliable narrator of this yarn. If you're a Poe fan, you know the type. He's likely to hear things like watches ticking or heartbeats beating and bury evil-eyed old men under floorboards and have a very guilty conscience. And our title character, the Black Cat, Pluto, is played by himself. Poe's stories are fun to adapt. They're remarkably elastic. And to those Poe police who moan and weep at adaptations of Poe, you know the ones. They're without imagination or humor. They're dried up inside and hateful, crusty, conservative, and sexless in their narrow view of art. The fact is, Poe's stories remain intact, regardless of whatever new work an artist is inspired to create from them. Just as Poe was inspired by others whose work he admired or whose work spoke to him, Poe's work remains intact, undamaged. Don't believe me? There it is, on the shelf. The complete tales and poems of Edgar Allan Poe. Take it down and read it. Take small sips and savor his work. No need to rush and swallow it whole. Mm, see? It's not been harmed at all. No matter the countless films, plays, and audio dramas it has inspired. But enough of that for now. Court is in session, and the judge has just called the defendant back to the stand, tried for murder, in our production of The Black Cat, inspired by the Poe story of the very same name. Quiet, quiet in this court. Does the defendant have anything to say? Any last words? Boy, 
Well, yes. Yes, I do. Proceed with your statement. Well, Judge, uh, your Lordship, members of the jury, it's like this, see? For a most wild yet homely narrative which I'm about to lay on you, I neither expect nor solicit belief. Mad indeed would I be to expect it in a case where my own senses reject their own evidence. Yet mad I am not, and I'm not dreaming. But tomorrow I die, and today I would tell my story without a bunch of blooming lawyers and knobs telling you what to think. I'm basically what you might call a life at a party, certainly in my circle of friends. They'll all tell you. Well, my lawyer didn't bring one bloody mate in here to testify is a mystery and then some. Ever since I was a lad, I got on with people. I loved little animals and every one me mum and dad would get me, I loved and cared for. The fact that so many dogs and cats went up missing in my time always perplexed them. But I loved every bloody pup, parakeet, goldfish they gave me. They were loyal when friends would just as soon stab you in the bloody back. There is something in the unselfish and self-sacrificing love of a brute which goes directly to the art of him who has had frequent occasion to test the paltry friendship and gossamer fidelity of mere man. And I loved Rita. I can't really believe she's gone now. It seems like just yesterday we met. I was a photographer, my star was on a rise, fashion and adverts for all the big magazines. My work was really getting noticed and I was flying. It was in Rome on a photo shoot for some Italian fashion designer. <laughs> All right, my lovelies, let's look alive. Lots to do this morning while the weather holds out. Yes, right. Beautiful girls, a perfect for selling my spring of fashion line. Frederico Fortunato knows the beauty, or my name's are not Frederico Fortunato. <laughs> right, very nice, lovely. Now you girls there, yes you bit, you drape yourselves over the fountain that way, lovely. And you girls, yes darling, you over there, lounge about the other way, right, lovely. And you, what's your name darling, you with the raven black hair. Right, Rita, you just stay right where you are in centre. I hope the fountain lovely. don't distract from my fashions. I'm not paying all this money for a famous British photographer to shoot the water, but my clothes and the pretty girls. Don't you worry about that, Frederico. You did hire the best in all of England and Europe, for that matter. You hire the one and only Alfie. He's brill, the best of the best. I hope you're right. Bet your bloody boots is right. When the women of the world open their cosmos and vogues, they'll only see what I, Alfie, want them to see. He won't give a toss about the Trevi fountain or any fountain after I work my magic. Ah, oh, Alfie, girls, ah. our photographer is here. Oh. That's right, Meatball, now step aside and let the maestro work his magic. All right then, girls, here we go. You work it now. Let's just burn a few rolls, warm up our engines, yeah? Lovely birds you selected, Bill. Gonna make old Frederick oh, Fortunato look good, we are. Hold it, hold it, Bill. What's it got? That, that raven air bird in front. What's it got? A bloody cat. Uh, you, a centre down front, get your uh, get your cat out of there. Where did that animal come from? No, it's not my cat, sir. I don't know where it comes from. It just showed up out of nowhere. Uh, what's its name, Bill? It. The cat or the model, Alf. Not the cat, you burnt the girl. Beauty she is, and more. Name's Rita. Oi, Rita, may I have a word with you for a moment, my lovely? Uh, Bill, give the girls ten. All right, ladies, relax. Ten minutes, coffee at the caravan. We just start. A we break. Where is Alpha going? It's a, it's a gonna rain. Oh, me. Oh, my. Nice person. Thanks, but it isn't mine. 
which no doubt was taught in Harry Rome with us girls. Oh, black and mysterious, black as your beautiful hair. What's your name again? Rita. My name is Rita. And I certainly know who you are, Mr. Alfie. <laughs> call me Alf. My friends call me Alf. Alf. Alf, it's been my ambition to do a shoot with you. Except it looks like that's not on the cards today, with this storm. What do you say we warm up and get cosy indoors? My car's just there, and the hotel's nearby. Really? Oh, I'd love to. Well, let's go then. I've got a bottle, and it's early. The hotel bar is just waking up. The barman. I'll have uh, the lady will have. What will the beautiful lady have? I'll have ginger ale. Gin- ginger ale? Yeah, ginger ale, I don't drink. The lady will have ginger ale. I'll have a vodka on the rocks. Three fingers, Sebi. Three. Allora, ginger ale per la bella signorina. Right. Ginger ale. E un vodka per il signore subito. Three fingers. So, so you don't drink? We'll soon fix that. That won't do at all. No, I never developed a taste for it. The occasional beer, you know, and, and Christmas punch. That's about as strong as my spirits get. My God, you're beautiful. Dark, black hair, like a gypsy. <laughs> How'd you fall into this modelling game, then? And wind up here in Rome on one of my gigs? It's the usual thing. It was a friend of mine who took some photos of me when I was at school. And he entered one in a contest in a local newspaper. And an agent saw it and then one job seemed to lead to another and here I am. Here you are. Yes, same agent. And now I'm on a fashion shoot in Rome. The great fashion photographer Alfie. With <laughs> me. <laughs> it's pretty amazing, eh? Eccoci. Un vodka per il signore e tre dita sul suo culo. Per la signorina un ginger ale. Cheers. Cheers. But what I really fancy is running a pet shop. A pet shop? You serious? Why would you want to do that? Why not? You make it sound such an horrible thing. Why tie yourself to one thing? You'd be a slave, not a master. You should be a model. Be an actor, travel and see the world. Well, lots of women go into business now and open shops and things. Take me, for instance. This fashion photography stuff is just a stepping stone. A stepping stone? That's right. You ever hear of Stanley Kubrick? Yeah, of course. I adore his films. I went to the 2001 premiere. Well, there it is. He's my role model, see? I don't want to be stuck shooting birds for wankers and their terrible fashion lines. I want to make films. And you know something else about Kubrick? No, he started just like me, a photographer, off magazine and such. And look at him now, working with big stars like Peter Sellers and Kirk Douglas, big contract with MGM. I want to travel the world and tell stories, oh, make great oh, art. And what the bloody hell is all that? Wow. It's Pluto. It's that black cat I found this morning at the shoe. It, it's all right. It's the lady's pussycat. Here you go. Just uh, go fetch us a saucer of milk, why don't you? Oh, he's beautiful. He's doing purr. Beautiful as you are, Peter. I think I'll name my pet shop after him for luck. Because he followed me here. It's a sign. But he now feels like you. Listen to me, purr. I thought black cats were bad luck and all. Ow, little bugger bit me. House on fire, me and Rita. Well, at the start, anyway. But things in life don't always work out the way you plan. Just a few months back in London, and old Rita, bless her heart, made enough as a model to open a pet shop. Then she just quit the cheesecake game, just like that. And the pet shop filled it right up, she did, like a regular Doctor Doolittle. Everything but the push me pull you. Pluto? Roman adoptee made himself right at home and the shop was home because me and Rita lived in the flat right above. Nice middle class sort of place with a garden out the back. I'd closed my photography studio and had turned down shoots because 
I was going to make films, see? Be a regular Richard Lester, right? <laughs> well. Stupid bastards. They can't push Alfie around, they can't. And that good for nothing agent of mine. Pah! Son of a bitch is worthless like teats on a bull. Oh, the studio won't make your film. I'll turn you down again. Bastards. Wow. Well, like bloody stupid, unimaginative, bean counting bastards. Oh, darling, I wish you'd take that script over to Hammer. Just a wee rewrite. And they'd, they'd have another smashing vampire film. They're so popular now. They'd love to have a talent like yours. I've been telling you that for months now since you fired. I wasn't fired. I quit those mindless bastards. And Hammer, what, me? Lower myself to make a load of cheap vampire pictures? That's your idea of the way up? I could bloody well see bloody Stanley, bloody Kubrick, making an all tits and blood, bloody Ingrid Pitt picture, I could. Really, you to kick a man in the balls when he's down, I don't you? You're upsetting Pluto, Alfie, please. All the animals are getting upset. Here, Pluto, you're a kitty kitty. Bollocks, screw the animals, you and your mad Dr. Doolittle dreams. Screw your canaries and your ferrets and your corgis and that bloody ugly monkey. And especially screw Pluto. You, you... You black fiend! Oh, Alfie, what have you done? You, you get out of your Pluto's eye out! Pluto. Not to put too fine a point on it, but that mongrel avoided me pretty solid for a few weeks after that. Bloody beast never really did like me. Well, I was under a lot of bloody pressure. Of course, uh, booze wasn't helping, found myself getting downright depressed and I knew I'd need to make changes, so it was the uppers and then the downers and the bennies and the hash and the pills and you know, I popped them like mad. I tried to revive my photography work, even set up a dark room to develop my film and make prints. Uh, set it up in the back room of Rita's pet emporium. I was in that dark room the day everything turned developing pictures of some wannabe band that fancied themselves to be the next Rolling Stone or something. Must have forgot to fasten the door properly. They watched the pictures that afternoon. I was running late with them and Pluto pushed the bloody damn door open. Bloody hell, flooding the room with light and ruining the afternoon's work. I, I, I grabbed the one-eyed son of a bitch and choked it. Choked it and then threw it across the room. Bit over the top, I realise now. You see, you have to see it from my end. Anyway, I had to do something with the lifeless carcass of the little Pluto, and so I scooped him up and took him out to the garden. I thought maybe I'd bury him, tell me that Pluto ran away. So I got outside to the garden, and I admit I don't remember a thing much after that. I do remember going back in to get my camera, the Hasselblad, and I remember taking pictures. I remember I was working in my developing room, developing some pictures of Pluto's lifeless body hanging from the tree, swaying to and fro, to and fro, to and fro. Elf? Elfie? Oh dear God, Elfie, come quick! What is it, dear? To say things went from bad to worse would be an understatement. Rita's business bloody flourished. My career was in the crapper. 
We weren't sleeping together anymore. I don't remember the last time I shared a bed, come to think of it. I was sleeping in the dark room at the time of the fire. Oh, oh yeah, the fire. Lots of testimony and witnesses. Lit marijuana cigarettes and chemicals for developing photographs don't mix. <laughs> anyway, the whole thing burnt down to the ground that day. Pet shop and all, all our clothes and all my photo gear gone, up in smoke. Rita was heartbroken over the animals. Most were saved. Mm. We found another flat. Insurance paid for that. Rita got out of the pet shop business. I hadn't any business for a year. She got a job at a television studio and I started staring at the walls. A curious thing, as I already testified. The new flat came with a cat. Just showed up one day. And the thing I still can't wrap my brain around, it was the spitting image of Pluto. Looked so much like that late beastie that Rita, who took to it right away and vice versa, called it Pluto Junior. This new flat we got, it, it had a fruit cellar sort of thing. Down there in the dank and dark, we kept some of our old effects from before that survived the fire. I don't know what possessed me that fateful day. That day that I borrowed the axe from the neighbour. I went down that dank hole to destroy what little was left of my old photographs and reminders of what was left of my career. I had opened a door to the cellar and it just started down when Pluto Jr. bolted from the windowsill and dashed right under my bloody feet. Tripped me up he did, the black bastard. Down I went, could have been killed, could have fallen on the axe for Christ's sake. I lay there dazed for some known god awful time. Finally I got up. I still I still had the axe in my hands when I heard Rita come down. Hello, darling. Nice to see you. It's been a little while. I'm leaving you, Alf. You can't say that I've held you back. I've done all I could to support you and more. Kept a roof over you, fed you, even drank with you. It's over, Alf. I wish I had something brilliant to say. I wish I could say at least the early days were fun, but they weren't. They were shit. <laughs> Goodbye, Alf. I'm taking the monkey. I can't find Pluto Jr. anywhere, but I hope he pisses all over your bed. It was then that I caved her skull with the axe. Well, that was that. I loved Rita. But this turn of events could get me into real trouble, I remember thinking to myself. This just wouldn't do. And then the idea came to me all at once. Crystal bloody clear it was as a Blackpool morning, see? There was a small recess in the cellar wall just opposite the stair, perfect for Rita's body. Made to fit. The landlord had been doing some repairs before we rented it, and there was this great pile of bricks and some leftover cement. Perfect, see? So I I got to work as Pluto Jr. watched. I walled Rita up and did a pretty good job of it for somebody who had never done a lick of masonry in his life. It was just about dawn when it was all finished and I was knackered. I climbed the stairs and sprawled out on the chaise when... Bloody hell! What could that be, I thought. I answered the door. It was the police. <laughs> You've heard their testimony here in this courtroom. Not much I could add, except I still don't understand. They said that Rita hadn't shown up at work at the TV station for three whole days. Was missing three days earlier. How long was I on that sofa? How long did I sleep? They searched the house. I, I played it cool. 
but couldn't believe I'd been out that long. Maybe it was the pills, the bennies or the downers or the booze or the bars or the goofballs or the pot. <laughs> and I, I led them all over the flat to show them that there'd been no foul play. Then to the cellar, they looked around, everything seemed to be going my way. But they made me uncomfortable, itchy. I stood in front of my handiwork, my brickwork, satisfied that I'd gotten away clean, and they were just headed back up the stairs when they stopped. They all turned to me and stared down at me. They started descending the stairs, coming right for me when... Now... It couldn't be. Couldn't be Rita crying out from behind a wall. She was dead. I caved her skull and buried her dead, dead, dead behind the wall three days ago. A constable seized me, pinned me to the ground as the detectives took up tools and smashed the wall, resting the bricks out one by one, tearing them down until it was all ghastliness. It was my Rita. My beautiful Rita. <laughs> see, see, she is dead. It couldn't have been her crying out. She is dead. And that's when I saw Pluto Jr., the source of the crying. Pluto Jr. perched on the head of Rita's corpse, alive, trapped with her behind the wall, crying out, crying out, crying out. The infernal bastard jumped off and ran past me, running over my chest as the police kept me pinned down, all of them. Every mother's son, a look of horror on their faces. Their faces. The horror. God, if I'd only had a camera at that moment, what a bloody good picture that would have been. You've been listening to Poe Forevermore Radio Theater's production of The Black Cat, based on the story by Edgar Allan Poe. The Black Cat was written and directed by Mark Redfield. Featured in the cast was Cesare Arena as the barman. The Black Cat starred Caroline Monroe and Mark Redfield. Post-production, Drat Productions Baltimore, Bill Dixon Engineer. Original music and arrangements by Jennifer Rouse. This production copyright, Damfino Media, all rights reserved. This is your announcer, Mary Ann Perry, inviting you to join us and listen to our other programs on Poe Forevermore Radio Theater. Well, I think that went rather well. I hope the audience liked that. What do you think? I think it went extremely well. I really enjoyed it. I, I like yeah, we had good fun. Good. Yeah, it was fun. I like working with you. We should do it again sometime. We will do it again sometime. I, I hope. I do hope. Sometime I think we, soon. I think we should do this thing that we've got cooking called Harker in the Shadow of Dracula. Fabulous. You'd play Mina Harker and I'd play Jonathan Harker and it would be uh, set in 1905 after the events of Dracula. I think we could have a lot of fun with that. I think we could. Would you come back and do that? I would love to come back and do that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right, so uh, back in the studio soon. Back soon. Thanks. No thank you to you.